Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 78. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Ira Zlotowicz. Ira is the president and co-founder of Eastern Union, one of America's largest and leading commercial mortgage brokerage firms. Established 20 years ago, Eastern Union now employs over 125 real estate professionals and closes on average $5 billion in transactions annually. Ira won national acclaim when listed on Crane's New York business 40 under 40. He is known as a visionary and innovative leader, utilizing technology and data to best serve his clients. Exemplary in business and in phil- phil- philanthropy, excuse me, alike, Ira supports charities and is focused on helping others achieve business success too. Ira, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Very welcome. Thank you for having me, Nathal. I've really been looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, Ira is not an easy person to pin down. So thank you very much for giving me a few minutes. This is going to be an exciting and very valuable conversation. You know, I remember Ira reading up a little bit about you, and I know you've been at this for a long time, but I'm curious to know how you got started. So talk us through it a little bit. So um, I started out working for a, uh, at that time, which was a small mortgage brokerage firm. Um, I worked there for about four years when I was 21 to 25. Um, During that time, I learned one major lesson in the commercial real estate space. You know, a lot of people, when it comes to certain luxuries in life, you assume that the more you pay for something, the better it is. And, you know, that makes the brand. I learned that focus on the volume of business. The more volume you do, don't care about the price. You have to lower the price, keep lowering the price. That's how you're going to grow the business. And um, that was one message I learned. I learned there. I worked there for four years. I left there as a partner. I I was a partner when I left. And when I opened up Eastern, and the main reason why I, I left is because they were purchased by a bank at that point. In the commercial mortgage space, for those that are not aware, the borrower pays me. I don't get paid by the lender. When you do your home mortgage, you do a loan, you think, hey, how's that broker make money? The bank pays them. It's called the yield spread. Based on how, what rate they charge you, the bank takes some of that profit and shares it with them. But my space doesn't work that way. It's possible people get yield spread, but the main core business model is the borrower pays. So the fiduciary responsibility is you have to maintain relations with everybody to get deals done. But who do I owe the fiduciary to? The borrower, he's paying me. And I found that when that firm was bought by a bank, the goal was first try to fill if everything is even or borderline, try to push business to that bank first. And the fiduciary started to change. So I left and I opened up Eastern Union um, about 21 years ago, 21 and a half years ago. So that's fantastic. I would actually like you, if you don't mind, to elaborate a little bit more. You talked about focusing more on volume than price. So what, what specifically do you mean? And what would be some other examples relevant to, uh, let's say, other markets as well? So <clears throat> just as a, as a nature, there are some people who would rather, if you, if you were opening up a store, would you rather open up Saks Fifth Avenue um, or even a more boutique shop than that? And or would you rather <clears throat> open up a Five Below store? If you found that you roughly make the same amount of money, what would you rather be? Some people want to prestige. I own Saks Fifth Avenue. Some people mm-hmm. want to prestige and not be, or not be as busy. Some people, don't want, some people just don't want to be able to stress that I have to get one customer a week, pays the bills. I want, to get, I want to get constant flow. Everybody has different pros and cons of why they want to do that. Taking the restaurant business, would you rather own the burger joint? Or would you rather own the high, end, high, high end restaurant? To tell your buddies, I'll get you into the restaurant tonight is a lot better than to say, my burger joint, I get you into. So that's the difference of personalities of different people. So I always preferred to get involved in the volume. That was always my me. I, I like, I prefer the volume instead of boutique. Because you also do boutique, there's different things you have to do. You have to, you have to put on this aura that you're doing this, put on a show, you're doing a better job and a better to justify those fees. On the other side, if you do, I do different. You have to put up, I have to meet a lot more people. So if I'm, if I, if, if I, I don't mind meeting people, I don't like dealing with people, then it's great on the way up. Everybody agrees in this industry that if I had a billion dollar pipeline, I'd rather have it of a bunch of small deals because if God forbid a deal dies, okay. I have $997 million of deals. But getting to the billion dollar pipeline, or whatever the number is, it's a lot tougher to build it up. So the build up is tougher. That's what most people don't want to deal with it. But I always chose to go for the volume. And when I was nervous, if I 
lower the fee, I'll get volume. But after a while, what happens? No, it ends up ends up balancing out in a very big way. So I'd like to drill down on that point because it sounded to me like you were making a distinction, at least to some degree, on what we might call personal preference or personality, right? What do you prefer? Do you want to be that high end or do you want to go for the volume and, and provide that low end service? So, so how does a person make that distinction? Like, how do you know what ultimately is the right thing for you? Is it just a matter of gut? Uh, do you do your research? How did you arrive ultimately at that decision that for you, at least, Ira, volume was the way to go? So just also to clarify, it's not necessarily the price change the quality of the work. Um, so I, I know and I'm confident. And, you know, as we're talking now, we said, you know, we were discussing before that, I'm, you know, I got a, an offer to open up a new company to revolutionize the space that I'm in. It's giving take that volume to the next level and automate as much of the, of the process as possible. But it's based on because I truly believe that I'm giving the exact same quality of service. This person just charging it. The pricing model is off in my industry. Certain industry is not like that. Certain industry is not possible to get the same quality. You just have to decide. <clears throat> I, you know, people could argue today to tomorrow, is, uh, buying a Lexus is it the same as, as getting a different brand that's priced cheaper. You could argue back and forth. Certain ties you buy, same quality as the look. What are you paying for? Is the brand. So something is not just about the quality. Some of the areas about the aura. When you put on a certain tie, it sends a certain message. Wear a certain watch. Things define you at certain times so if you're focusing on the product itself yeah price could be a difference you know you could say the same quality right many times someone shows the exact same quality private labeled but it doesn't come with a whole different type of package so i think the starting point is more when you go into business what would you rather i interview people one of the questions i used to ask people when i hire them just as brokers if you had a choice to make a million dollars by doing 10 deals making a hundred thousand each doing 50 deals of making just this amount each making 500 deals this amount each, what, you, or what range would you want? And everyone gives me their answer. Some of us had rather just live in the big deals. There's some people look, look at, take real estate. There's some people buy these garbage buildings, small buildings all over the place. They would rather deal with that set of headaches. And other people would rather say, I want to own one building, New York City, skyscraper. And they're going to fight till they get that building. It's all or none. Is there a right or wrong? No, it's a certain gut. You know, when I speak to organizations that raise money, you know, they obviously you'd rather try to raise money from 10 people to give you 100,000 each, hit you a million dollars. I was always, I, I, I started, Janelle, there's a lot of websites that do it, crowdfunding for charity. I said, yeah, but wouldn't you rather get a thousand people giving you $18 and then you build up, you know, a few of those grow with you? Everyone has different pieces and, and positions of what they want to do. So it's a blend of your own gut of what you want to start. You're going to end up gearing into a certain area, that type of business. You can't convince someone who believes they want to be boutique. You can't be high volume. Those two things can't go together. Interesting. So I have a question because you talked about automating before and as you look towards your future and obviously in the bio I read about innovation and technology as well. You know, I'm a little bit old school and I kind of think of things like, you know, uh, uh, transactions and whatnot as very personal in nature. Uh, so, so where does technology fit into it? What are the opportunities? What are the advantages? And why are you so keen on really pushing this area within your industry? So I, I will tell you my you know, I spent a lot of time studying this, this specific topic. Where's the blend of human and technology? So as some people believe, believe in my space, technology will never replace the broker. Other people believe technology will totally replace the broker. My belief is there'll always be a hybrid between a human, not necessarily call them a broker, a human and technology. So someone told me a story once about, about um, by Amazon, that when he started, before he opened up Amazon, he went into the stock brokerage business to build like an E-Trade type of business. And he was under the belief that Jeff Bezos, that technology replaced humans in, in, in stock buying. And he got handed himself on a silver platter. He lost tons of money. What he learned from that, his biggest mistake, and that build Amazon is that there's always going to be a human element to it. So as much as you see Amazon, pure technology playing in your mind, what does he obsess over? The customer experience. Reading the emails, the feedback. So there was that human side of it. So what part is the human side? Look, I'm doing with you a podcast and... I'm sitting wherever I am. You're sitting wherever you are. We're doing this over Zoom. 10 years ago, you're going to do it that way. And people say, you're not going to get the same conversation experience if they're not in the same studio together. I would like to believe that's the same. And if not, it's marginal difference. And the benefit of having more episodes out online quicker than having less, that's that blend. So where's that line? You find the line. So my business, it's a blend of what part of the business needs the human, I mean, the broker, quality broker, 
What part of it needs an executive assistant to help the broker? And what part of that could you get an off-the-shelf process to get done? So if it used to take, in my analogy I give in my office, uh, an underwriter who ran deals would be able to close about 75 deals a year. But as we automate different things behind the scenes and as you're using Excel better and everyone, all the counterparties using Excel and email and Dropbox and all different systems are using the same, we ought to get that person able to handle 100 to 125 deals, moving towards 150 deals. So is the broker going to still be involved? Yes, but now the broker could oversee many more deals with having that human inter interaction when you need it. But don't forget, on the other side of the coin, you have banks in my industry who are also automating parts of that process. So they try to streamline simple deals, go into this bucket anyway. So you're only really talking to someone when something spits up, there's a problem. So because of that, slowly but surely, the worlds are changing where it's going to. So technology is not going to replace the human, but it's going to limit the power that they have and only within certain boxes. And less percent requires that human throughout. And that's what I'm trying to find that right blend of where that goes to. Okay, so that's great because actually uh, leads into my next question. And that is the question of blend, right? So you're talking about customer experience. A customer wants to feel like they are the world. They are your universe. You focus exclusively on them. <clears throat> At least a lot of people do. And at the same time, you're trying to automate, you're trying to be able to create deal flow that helps to optimize your performance on all fronts, the bank side, your side, et cetera. So I know you're kind of in your mind, you're tweaking it, you've had different processes and conversations, but practically speaking, Ira, how are you gathering the data and what kind of data are you looking for to determine the customers are still happy, certainly happy enough to justify this new direction? So it's a great question. The, the way we're being thoughtful of that question is we're not changing how we deal with the client, for what the client wants. So when I talk to a client and yesterday they say, send me the numbers, I tell them, okay, send me the numbers. I can say, by the way, if you prefer, you can also upload it to my portal. If you prefer, when you want updates, aside from calling me, you could, I could send you automatic emails or on the portal, you could see where the deal is tracking live. Behind the scenes, is where I'm using most of my technology. Behind the scenes, systems we're putting in place, step-by-step -step systems. So the client's slowly noticing, hey, I have other options to communicate with Ira if I want, number one. Number two is that they're getting back to me much quicker. It used to take three days for this step of the process. I'm now getting it back in two and a half days or two days or one and a half days. And that's what's been happening. So I'm never sacrificing. I'm running a dual process at the same time. Same human plus that. And slowly but surely we're noticing that as clients... And it would call me 10 times a day, 10, 10 times to get updates. Slowly calling nine, checking once online, calling eight once online. And that's what's slowly happening as time is progressing. Also, they're saying, hey, because the information is on the system online, they don't have to just call me. They could also, out of those 10 times, three times they called my assistant. So I'm down to five times having to deal with the clients. I have now more time to service other clients. And that's what's happening. So they're not, there's no slack off but I'm doing that dual processing at the same exact time. But the heavy change is internal behind the scenes by me, not client facing. I actually heard three different things in your answer, and I want to drill down a drop, if I may, on at least some of it. First of all, I love the words, if you prefer. I think that was fantastic because you're giving ownership to your client. You know, I remember, for example, when I'm a former head of school, Lead to Succeed knows that. And so when I used to walk into classrooms and provide, you know, feedback on observa observations that I did and all of that, I would do this, you know, wonderful report, very detailed, providing the te teacher with all the information here, so-and-so and kind of like went through my list mm -hmm. and I would send it because it was in a portal that we utilized and it was automated and sent out uh, to the teacher. And then it was like crickets, nothing. Um, and then what I started to do is call the teacher in first and we had a conversation. And then when I was done, I wrote the report. And I added the words as we discussed. And I found that the words as we discussed really made a fundamental difference because it was now a conversation. The teacher had real, uh, a meaningful say in what happened and what I understood, what my takeaways were, and how they were ultimately evaluated. So this is a little bit different because it's not evaluative, but it does give an element of control. That was one thing. The second piece is the options. I think the options are great because we love to be able to be in control as much as we can. If you prefer lends me that option, going online versus calling, different people will do it differently. The newer generation, I would imagine, will be more tech savvy and more inclined. And then finally, you talked about something, you didn't talk about it directly, but I heard 
the idea of conditioning your clients, right? So the first way I'm used to going with my broker, it would be the following processes, but now I'm starting to get conditioned. Hey, I can get this information online. Hey, I can go onto my phone and grab it on the app. Exactly. Hey, I can find another way to do it. So you're, you're sort of gently training me as the customer to interact more positively from your perspective with you. So it takes less of your time. So there's a lot there. I'd love to hear a little bit more if you wanted to unpack any of those. Right. So, so what we're also finding slowly what's happening is this slowly starts becoming a competitive advantage for us because now the client working with us gets a better experience than other broker shop they're working with because every the broker shop is believing that the human is the only way of communication. So they're not looking to, to change any parts. Number one, number two, is that I learned, and this is for a different uh, conversation, is that everybody has their expertise and everyone's great at certain things and not great at other things. So you could be called a great person because you average it out on a scale of one to 10, you're somewhere between the eight and a nine out of 10. No one's perfect. Every great person is eight or nine, but what makes up your eight and nine is different than mine. I could be a 10 in certain areas, six in other areas, and not necessarily the same. So right now, most companies are working with with general practitioners. I deal with a broker. I take all his pluses and minuses. He hires on his team. He has a team slowly. That's his team. What I did is that I make back office centralized teams. So my broker doesn't have his own team. Instead, I hire an expert numbers person, an expert tech number, an expert in every step of the process. So when a client calls up, they get direct access to an expert behind the scenes signing off to everything. So now a client's dealing with a 10, the humans are tens. It's a group of tens working together. I have a 10 in this area, 10 in this area. If you met each person separately behind the scenes, they could have a lot of weaknesses in other areas, but I didn't hire them for that. We took this so much that as a company, you know, there's a fellow Benjamin Wolf came out with a book just now on fractional leadership, which is like the new thing. It's outsourcing. And you take like the C-suite. I'm starting a new company with venture capital money. Most of the C-suite are fractional because I don't need a $250,000, $300,000, dollars $400,000 CIO or a CTO, or a CFO, or a CMO at that caliber full-time for the talents. I would rather have a number two or number three working full-time that's ambitious enough to want to get to number one, and then use that number one person as one day a week. When I combine the two salaries I'm paying, I'm saving net money, but now I have the best of the world. I have someone living the business 24-7, that area with big aspirations, and the greatest coach in the world. The person was worth $400,000 just getting it for one day a week, and I take those paid together. And I kept taking this, is that, that's the gig economy. Google's, the, I mean, um, your, your Uber is the best example, right? When you need a car, you press the button, a car is there. And they're making more money. People used to say in the beginning, oh, they're not making so much money because it used to cost $100 to go to the airport. Now it's only 75. Yeah, but they used to go to the airport one way, 100, and come back empty. Now they come back for 75 each way and they're making the money for every step of the way. So this theme took us from the lower level all the way to the top level. And then we built technology for each area just to streamline their process a little bit better. You go 1% here, 1% here, 1% here, you step back, hey, it's 20, 30% before you look back. Plus you have a great client experience of what you're doing. Wow, okay, so a couple of things. One, I'd like to reiterate the, the customer experience piece I think is critical. You know, They often say that people will buy from those that they know, like, and trust. So if you're providing a really great experience, if people see that you have expertise in all areas, that is absolutely a, a game breaker or, or a, a deal maker for you. And uh, certainly a differentiator. Um, I am curious to know, though, uh, Ira, when you talked about uh, sort of um, this new model, this new piece where you're talking about instead of having full-time uh, C-suite executives, that you have them available almost like it sounds on demand or some kind of configuration, what kind of people, you know, like I'm trying to think about it from a hiring standpoint, what kind of people are, quote, good enough to give you that level of quality and at the same time, willing to come to you at a reduced frequency, because I would imagine that most of those folks are looking for full-time work. No. So how do you find somebody who's only coming to you for, let's say, one day a week or so? So I, I think that there's a huge industry. It's called the gig economy. Mm -hmm. Websites for lower level, now it's going for higher level. There are people who have companies, they just outsource expertise. So you, you went on LinkedIn and said, I'm looking for somebody that's a, that's, that's like a freelance. It's freelancing at the next level. So you think mm -hmm. a freelancer that would, you commit them enough hours that they really think about you beyond the two hours a week when you call them. You commit to 10 hours a week, 40 hours a month at the rate that they're giving, 
you step back and say, you know something, I'm paying them $150 an hour, it's $6,000 a month. It's a lot of money when you look at it that way. But that person's, wow, now you're the most important client to them. They're going to think about all the talents towards you. I get the benefit of someone who's involved in 30 different businesses. But when I need that expertise, I know they sign off to it, it's done. So I do this at every single level outsourcing, from C-suite down to every level of the company. I take every department, if someone's willing to, to, to go that route, I end up having just competent general practitioners in the office, like coordinate between all the third party or the outside third party. Cool. So, I mean, there's a lot more. I w- I'd love to hear more about the incremental growth because I feel like if we're constantly making moderate improvements um, over time, you have huge dividends. You know, you talked about it. So I'm going to leave that there for now. I want to talk about something else, Ira, if I may, because it's really, really um, something that I'm fascinated by. You know, you've been at this for a while. You've seen great success, thank God. And, and it looks like you've got a lot more, uh, you know, many more aspirations. What keeps you going? You know, because oftentimes people feel like they've reached a level of success. Ah, I got enough. I have enough money. I have enough this. I have enough that. Not that here I'm judging, um, you know, your financials and all of that. But I get the idea that you could move on to other things. You could slow it down a little bit. What keeps someone like you so motivated to keep the, the pedal on the metal, to keep pushing, raising the bar? So the answer is that, you know, I think about this all the time. What would I do if I stopped? Like, it's not like tomorrow when I'm going to stop and just go to a beach and retire the whole day. So I'm going to do something. What am I going to do? I'm at the core. I'd like to always be able to give back. I'd like to, I'd like to, what keeps me motivated is to be able to, you know, help, you know, help people with innovative ideas to help them exceed their expectations, problem solve for them. That's at the root what I want to do. So I can either close down my business and retire and then help people that way or use my business to do that. And within the business, I get to be able to help clients solve their problems get to help people get themselves a new job and get the jobs and become successful at the job. I get to take the profits of the business and invest and put money behind organizations, charities that will pay that same thing back. So the drive is to keep doing more of the same thing. The minute that's where, when I, I look back and say, why did I leave that first company to open up Eastern? Why am I leaving Eastern to go do the next business? Because in the first company to Eastern, I couldn't, I couldn't price, um, they, the fiduciary was changing. And I'm not really helping a person. A person who walks in my door, I want to be able to help them. And I couldn't fully help them because sometimes, even if it was better than to go left, the company wanted to potentially go right and didn't help me. At this point, the, it's a dual universe is that I want to have a product within my current company, but it's not really possible. Like my dad used to say a line from Fiddler on the Roof, a bird and a fish could fall in love, but where would they make a home for themselves? Mm. So you have, I, I look today and say, hey, is 100% market share of commercial real estate owners. 60% exclusively approximately use a broker. Another 20% use a broker. So I mean, go direct. Another 20% sometimes. So the universe of exclusive brokers is shrinking. Do I want to play in that arena or in a different arena? I want to help a lot more people. And if I change the pricing, then I'm also helping them by, by pricing them the way that pricing should be done right. And that's the idea of the new business. So what's going to drive me, my products, and is always a matter of being help, helping at all different levels. And that's why I always want to be able to help when someone walks in to find that perfect marketplace efficiency where, hey, this is really a perfect blend. I'll bring a bank to this point, an owner to this point, at this price point, everybody wins. And that's why I love to be in a situation that everybody wins. So it sounds like you've really identified your why, your purpose. You've told us a bit about how you got started. I'm curious to know what in particular, what attributes, what behaviors would you say um, you most credit for your success? So. I look back at the upbringing from my parents and um, from my father um, always told me I have a longer term vision. Don't just care what people saying now. Focus a little bit longer term. Let your horizon be a little bit longer. Don't listen, listen to the naysayers today. You never do anything. Um, and number two is treat your staff. Just remember they have a family. They're only coming to work to support their family, nothing else. Treat them as family. I never, I take pride in a very big way that I never had, had, had an employee leave me because they got a better job offer somewhere else. No one ever left me for a better price. They were always leaving because it was a mutually agree that's not for them. They wanted to switch careers, but it wasn't, oh, are you paying me a hundred grand? I got to 120 somewhere else. That never happened. So, you know, the way you treat employees and, you know, my issue is I took it too personal. I try to help someone. And like, if you would have your own kid, you get frustrated and scream, what are you doing? Don't you see you're going the wrong way? That's the biggest thing I had to work on, not to take it to that level of uh, getting frustrated. But then I got my father, treat employees like family, 
and they're human, they're people, they have rough days, things are going on, and that's one part. And for my mom was the trusted advisor. You know, your word is everything. You know, and a lot of times she just has a story about her parents, her father, they had his business, and um, the business was, um, was uh, you know, it was, he, there was a fire, it was getting, everything was getting lost. And someone said, why don't you file bankruptcy? And the United States can file bankruptcy. You don't owe your investors money anymore. We vendors. And he says, I took money from them, but big deal. That was a debate. And you, you have your own moral code as an Orthodox Jew, follow from, from God, and you follow, follow the, the Bible. And to me, it's like the fact you could file bankruptcy is not the excuse. So, you know what I mean? Like that, your word is everything. You have people carve out. Now, do I get messed up? Because on when it came double standard and, and to my negative, where I gave some my word and I know if it was in reverse, they wouldn't have kept their end of the bargain, but because the contract wasn't written exactly. And yet later on, I went to tell them, hey, show me in writing. You didn't say that. So I always left. And those are the two things that are fundamental. So my tagline in the office, ultimately, is we're a trusted advisor. You know, when you get off the phone, whether you're a banker, or you're a client, you're somebody that you could trust if I told you something. Things could go wrong, but not because they didn't know something. You always have the transparency. And that's the direction I want to go. That's so the new company I'm opening is actually is a merger between the words GP, which is general partner, so another word for real estate owner, and transparency. The name of the company is Gparency, is a blend of those two words coming together. It's the, I love it. And I love the fact that it really is rooted in, in family uh, values and tradition, of course, and religion as well. So let me ask you one last question for this segment, Ira, and that is, you know, you've brought a lot of people on uh, with a lot of success. What qualities of all the qualities that people that people possess, technical skills, personality, whatnot, what are you most interested in the people that you bring until now into Eastern Union and in your future in your future operations? So I think to a large extent, you said we talk about the why, you have to understand their why. Because at the end of the day, people are motivated by money. They're motivated by a why. Uh, money is a nice way to keep score. But there's a why ultimately, um, and it's really someone who has a drive and a passion, and an unrelentless goal to get to the, and is going to get there. You have certain people who say, no matter what, I'm getting there. So I want people. You know, I started the biggest game changer in the office. We took on this thing called EOS, Entrepreneur Operating System, major game changer. Yes. And one of the things they they crystallized because you used to have a lot of turnover, and you have turnover in mortgage brokers. Makes sense. The guy wants to try the business. Gal wants to try the business turnover. But in certain positions, why would they turn over? They told us a thing called GWC. Get it? Want it capable? This sums it up. When you hire someone, go through the GWC test. Does the person get the job that you're trying to hire them for? Do they get it or they just, okay, it sounds good to them? Do they want that job or do they want a job? And are they capable? You can negotiate capable. You don't have to play the guitar. You want to learn how to play? Just sit there every night for three hours. But if you don't get it, you don't want it, you're not going to go through the pain. And I found a lot of people, I look back in hindsight, either didn't fully get the job. They got what they had to do, wake up in the morning and answer a few questions. They didn't get why. And more importantly, was the was the want it. Most people just want a job. So I started hiring someone in my, ex, in my niches. So what do you want to do? Do you want to break into real estate or you want to be an underwriter? If your goal is to be a broker, I don't want to hire you as an underwriter now because you're going to every day look to be an next promotion. But I meet people who, who they want to be an underwriter. They want to do with numbers all day long. This person wants to deal with this all day long, marketing all day long. If I don't get to get it, want it, I don't even move to capable. If I get the triple crown, those people will fly. So it'll be the same person, different roles could have an issue. So on this last question on this point before we move on, see, in my mind, I'm thinking about it from the leadership standpoint. And oftentimes it is really the responsibility of the leader to set the vision, to motivate the people, to get everybody engaged. It sounds to me that you're looking for people who are bringing all of that in with them. And you're just setting sort of the framework for which they can plug into. Is that is that a correct understanding? Yes and no, because it's what you're saying is actually accurate. The way you're describing what the leader's job is. If I bring a monkey in, I'm, my job is also to motivate the monkey. But can you imagine if I started with 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 a a a, a monkey or a person that, that that's what they wanted to do? I still have to provide the motivation. I keep bringing the team together. But I realized when I hired someone in a certain role, they didn't really want to be a secretary. They didn't want it. They don't work. They didn't get that their job is really to free up their boss, not just do tasks given to them. They didn't get it. That's what the problems were. So at the foundation is if they pass the GWC test, then you have a very good chance of being able to motivate them. And you have a whole company together, a bunch of GWCs in line, sharing the core values. It makes it much easier on the leader and you can take things up to a higher and higher level quicker. Nice. Okay, we are going to transition now to rapid fire. And I'm going to begin with a quote or a motto that you live by or think about often. So it's live for today without sacrificing tomorrow. Make every decision that what would I want to do today and make sure that if I chose the wrong one, could I still go back or I, how it would affect the rest of my life. So take the one that has the best uh, opportunities forward. Interesting. I love it. 
What's the best investment you've ever made other than stocks or real estate? Uh, people, employees. That's uh, all day long. And that's my investment. Focus okay. And, and the last one, because I, I, I'm writing a book on the topic. I love to talk about it. A productivity tip, Ira, that helps you get more done. Delegate. I mean, it's just such a biggie. Big, yeah. It's, you know, delegate and know that the person, I tell people, know that the person you're delegating to will not do it as good as you. Mm hmm. If you and, know be able that, to and be able to live with it. Yeah, because in my line, I tell people, is there anything that that person could do that will mess it up so much you can't fix it? And once you realize, no, if they mess it up, I can pick up the pieces. Okay, so what's the risk? Net, you might find something good that will actually save you time. Focus on your time that you're saving, not on the other person. So I know, Ira, you're active on, on LinkedIn and I'm sure other platforms as well, but how can folks who want to connect with you, learn more from you, do business with you, how can they find you? And how can they benefit, benefit more from your wisdom and your expertise? Thank you. So LinkedIn is the best way. Um, I give out my cell number. It's 917-597-2197. Very brave. My email address is irz at easternunion.com. You know, it's going to switch, but there'll be a bounce back set up, I hope. Um, but uh, for right now, that's the information. But LinkedIn is the best. Okay, not the best. I'm saying email is the best, but uh, sure. Okay, so Ira, one final life lesson, please, to wrap up this very engaging session. Catching me off guard. Some of the things we, you know, we said there. It's um, it doesn't have to be business related. Just a, a bigger part of the really, it's, it's like I tell people a lot of times. It's a lot about it's about the. Uh, it's like the ten. It's the ten, ten, ten rule. You know, think about how you're going to feel in ten seconds, ten minutes. You know, 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years, 10 decades, someone told me to add to it. A lot of people make a decision for right now. Like I said, my father told me, have a longer horizon. Make a decision. Where do you want to be in two years? Are you willing to suffer through certain pain if you know you're going to get there? Like everyone says the right words, but actually live by it. I want to sweep the floor if it meant me to get to the corporate office. Are you really willing to do that? You want to have people make fun of you? Oh, you're the guy sweeping the floor for those first year that they don't know what your aspirations are. And most people listen to the naysayers right away. So you go... And that's it. Take it to the end of the movie. I remember hearing from Tony Robbins more than once that people overestimate what they can accomplish in one year, but underestimate what they can accomplish in five. And so as you're sort of expanding our horizons a little bit and thinking Hello. differently about what's out there, you know, we have to have that framework. What do we want to become? And that ultimately pushes you through. And each day you have to slog through it and things are difficult. But if you have something that uh, really is motivating you for, mo for, you know, for most people, it'll help push you there. So Got thank it. you. That's great. That was great. Yeah, I appreciate okay. it. Thank you so much. I appreciate no, it. It was a pleasure talking with you. Pleasure learning from you. And uh, looking forward to deepening the relationship over time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 